welcome back to another video. I am recording in my new favorite hoodie. Look at Godzilla. Godzilla looks so good in this. The body horror in this is so beautiful. I love it. Oh my god. Me discovering my love for Godzilla is the best thing of 2021. I have two books that I'm going to talk about. The first book is The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. Evelyn Hardcastle will die and the main character has eight days to identify the killer. Except every time he wakes up, he's in a different body. So this book is like a time loop historical fiction murder mystery. I really like the way Stuart Turton writes. He has this nice attention to detail and he doesn't go through these boring descriptions of people, things, and environments unless it is relevant to the story. Because the main thing I hate about books, especially when it comes to books set in an entirely new world, a new fantasy world, is that authors tend to tell you and describe to you the environment and all of these unnecessary details that I don't really care about. The mystery is really fun to follow along with. I don't read that many mystery books so I don't know if it's well written in the genre but I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really well paced and it always keeps you guessing and it doesn't hand you the answers to the mystery. There are a lot of books, movies, games, TV shows about people inhabiting other bodies literally or through virtual reality or through a machine or whatever. Whatever the case is, storytellers tend to overlook describing the experience of inhabiting a body that is not your own. Stuart Turton pays attention to the way each body has its own natural instincts and morals, and how physically different each body feels because of exhaustion, age, alcohol, so many different things make his version stand out in a very common sci-fi trope. My recommended reading experience is to not read too many reviews or information about this book so that your experience with this book and the mystery is mostly your own. Take your time reading the book and act like a detective as you gain new information. I really enjoyed the struggle of trying to understand what was happening and recalling information because that struggle was paralleled in a main character who did not know who he was and was experiencing all of these events and finding information out of order. I really like this author and I've already read both of his books and I I'm so sad that he doesn't have more because I want to read more. So this year I realized I don't read a lot of horror despite my love for horror in other forms of media. So I've been trying to read more horror novels and I have a new favorite book and it is aquatic horror novel. The book is Into the Drowning Deep by Mira Grant. The otter goddess sailed to the Mariana Trench to film a mockumentary about mermaids but was lost at sea. Seven years later a new crew has been assembled but this time is prepared to discover the mysteries and the truth of what happened at the Mariana Trench with a security team and hundreds of scientists. I love the way Mira Grant writes. Stuart Turton and Mira Grant I have never met an author that just understands the type of writing that I need from my stories. So like horror and plot aside, the world building is my favorite part of this book. So many books and films take place in California, but artists never make the effort to authentically represent the city. It'll just be some generic city and it won't have any of the characteristics and culture of the city in real life. Mira Grant was so specific and accurate in describing the cities in the first few chapters that I immediately fell in love with this book. Like that alone told me what to expect from her writing and how much she cares about world building. The characters are so fleshed out and wonderful and how they like add on to the world building is so amazing. Every single one of them distinctly views and engages with people, the world, and society based off their backgrounds and personalities and identities. Like there's a bi character, there's an autistic lesbian, there's deaf characters, there's a chronically ill character, there's rich characters, and like all of those characteristics means that they engage with the world differently and each are so well thought out because she understands human behavior 
and it, I'm just so amazed <laughs> with her writing. She's just so amazing. And then on top of that, they're all scientists. And like, you can tell the amount of research she did into everything in this book. And she like presents this information to the audience in a very relevant way. It's, oh, this book is so good. This book is so good. The pacing and conclusion of this story is really bad though. <laughs> it's it's like the last three chapters or maybe four. It's, it's not, it's not great. But the build up and everything else about this book is just, it's, it's too amazing. I am willing to forgive her for that. I'm just so glad to be introduced to writers that, that, that are specifically tailored to me. Like, it's just amazing. I love this feeling. So, hey, um, I don't know if you know this, but I had a James Bond phase <laughs> in like October. I literally watched all the movies in like 35 hours. <laughs> It's embarrassing, but also like, I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. It's kind of good. <laughs> I don't know, it's so weird. Three things convinced me to watch the James Bond movies. One was a tweet about Daniel Craig's James Bond being bisexual. A Daniel Craig interview where he says that he kisses the men who are co-starring in his films to break the ice, <laughs> okay? Three, three, a gay whipping scene. <laughs> so, yeah. The third thing, the tweet about the gay whipping scene. I woke up, October 9th, I woke up and my first thought was, what the fuck was the James Bond whipping scene? I gotta know what this shit was. <laughs> so I pulled it up on YouTube and I watched a clip of this gay whipping scene and um, y'all were not exaggerating. <laughs> I don't know if y'all want me to spoil it, but um, James Bond is strapped to a chair, naked, the villain tortures and whips his ass and balls and only his ass and balls and James Bond enjoys it. <laughs> Why is this in the movie? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's there. It is real and he enjoyed it. It's just so weird. Oh my God. Um, yeah, so Casino Royale is the first movie and the best one. It's so, it's so stupidly funny. Like, <laughs> it's so stupidly funny. I am surprisingly very defensive of this movie. Like, when No Time to Die came out, Everyone was tweeting about James Bond and which movie was the best movie. And when it came to Casino Royale and people were shit talking it, I got, I was like, I was ready to fight them. Yeah, I just, I have so many opinions about this franchise. And like the night of watching No Time to Die, I came home and I spent two hours making a presentation about the James Bond films. <laughs> But what's most fascinating about the James Bond franchise, well, Daniel Craig's James Bond movies, is that he actually had a planned character arc and they paced it out throughout all five movies and executed it and finished it. And it's just really nice to see a franchise reach the conclusion of their story without it being interfered and changed by studios or canceled or forgotten because I'm just so heartbroken over Zack Snyder's DC universe. In November, I fucking, ugh, for some reason, I accepted this film challenge of watching a movie every day. And I'm not gonna talk about any of those movies here because I made a video for it. And I talked about it a lot over there. So if you wanna hear me talk about it, you can go to the video. I, oh, I have some, some new favorite movies from that challenge though so it's kind of a good thing but i also hated my life while doing that stupid fucking challenge so okay neon genesis evangelion this is a anime that i watched when i was younger i was a young little teenager and i didn't pay attention i watched it during class and so i didn't understand it and it didn't hit me the way it should have and also it was it's a lot to take in, like it's a lot about mental health and my understanding of mental health was very basic at that age so I really didn't understand the themes it was exploring. I really loved the aesthetic, I love the merchandise for it, I love mecha anime, but I didn't like the anime. Rewatching it now as an adult, I understand it and 
now I'm so fucking in love with Evangelion and I'm about to become that annoying Evangelion fan. There's thousands and thousands of videos explaining the history of Evangelion and I totally recommend that y'all watch it. But an overly simplified explanation is that in the process of making Evangelion, the creator was suffering from depression and like halfway through started using Evangelion as a gateway to explore themes of mental health. So towards the end of the anime, it's less about the story and the anime and more about of an analysis of the human psyche, specifically an analysis of the characters' depression, trauma, anxiety, isolation, and PTSD of being a teenager burdened with the responsibility of the world and piloting Evangelions and experiencing so much death and trauma and loss. There's so many themes and I've missed some of them, but it's it's such a fun story to just analyze. As an analysis of human psychology, I fucking love it. Like, I love it so much, but it doesn't conclude and satisfy the story, hence the movie, The End of Evangelion. The End of Evangelion is an alternative ending to the anime that is more focused on the plot as opposed to mental health. The action and visual imagery is so amazing and so awesome. And although the movie is separate from the ending of the anime, when you combine the, psycholog the, when you combine the psychological analyses of the anime with the movie, it adds so many more layers to just themes and pain and trauma and angst. It, ugh. Yes, Evangelion is so amazing. It's so amazing. And I'm so sorry that I thought you were boring and that I wasn't paying attention when I first watched it. <laughs> the pacing is terrible in this anime. But when it's a good episode, it's a really fucking good episode. I just think that Evangelion is so smart and so brilliant with its themes. I love the art style. I love the religious imagery. I love the designs of the angels and the designs of the, of the evas. Evas are... I love the evas. They're so beautiful. I really love this genre and I haven't felt this much love and passion for a mecha anime since Code Geass. And now that I'm actually a fan of Evangelion, I don't have to feel bad about buying merchandise and fan art. <laughs> okay, now the last thing that I'm gonna talk about is Arcane. Arcane is the first animated League of Legends TV show and everyone is in love with it and so am I. It takes place in two twin cities, Piltover, which is city of the rich, and Zaun, which is underground, and the city of the poor and oppressed. And it is told through the lives of two sisters who were separated as children and are now fighting on different sides of the war. I I don't like League of Legends. I find it a very boring game. Um, <laughs> but ever since KDA performed at Worlds 2018, I have always kept up with League of Legends videos. League has really great original music and really great animated videos, so you can't judge me for this. When Arcane was announced, I was so hyped and I waited so long for its release. It's it's amazing how immersive the show is, especially for people who aren't familiar with the lore of League of Legends. Everyone is talking about the show, so I feel like there's nothing I can say that hasn't already been said. Great animation, of course. The texture and the colors are so vibrant and bold and unique. The original soundtrack, so fucking good. The world building, the lore, the characters, their character designs, it, the steampunk aesthetic, the well-paced emotional plot and character relationships. Queer couple and pain and angst and loss and angst and pain. I love pain so much. I cannot, I cannot emphasize the pain of this TV show. It hurts so good. There's just so many things. There's so many things about this show. It's so amazing. Y'all do not want to miss out on Arcane. And that's all I have to talk about for fall. Well, I do have more things to talk about, but they weren't the highlights. Sorry to Venom, let there be carnage, but... I don't know, I think Venom is just a constant love <laughs> in my life. It's always there in the back of my brain. So like, I feel, I don't know, it doesn't feel like a highlight for me. 
but Venom Let There Be Carnage. That was a thing that came out and I still- I love it. It's so gay. I hope you enjoy- <laughs> I'm still thinking about Venom. This is so bad. This is so bad. Can you not? Brain, please, can you not do this right now? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this video and you like me, <laughs> you should like and subscribe to my channel. Take some time to stretch your body and drink some water and take care of yourself. And I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Bye.